our best defense to disease is a strong immune system. My sister is a senior science teacher and when she teaches her students immunology, at the end of the presentation, she says something that I don't think most science teachers say. She says, see, the body was designed to heal itself. And I'd like to suggest that, that we were created in the image of God. And when God created the human body, he put an immune system in it. And it's a powerful immune system that is able to heal us. Now, in the presentation that we looked at on Tuesday, we looked at a whole lot of little natural remedies that when applied to the body, when it is not well, can boost the healing process and help us as we go through it. And there were three, two, there were three short words we looked at. Do you remember our three words? The human body will heal itself if you give it the right condition. And if the body can heal itself, why are so many sick? Well, they're sick because they don't know the conditions. Many are sick through ignorance. And do you remember the other small word? It's a four letter word this time. Time. Sometimes we need to just give it time. Sometimes we just need to give it time to do its work because it knows what to do. And I gave you some verses. One was um, Galatians 6 verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we will reap if we faint not. And then the other verse was, was found in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35 where it says, Cast not away therefore thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience. <laughs> There's the time factor again. In that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Faith in an amazing body that has an inbuilt ability to heal itself. And so if it's not healing this minute, give it a little bit of time. It will heal. And if you see improvement, as we looked at the other day, that's your, that's your body saying, we can do this. We can do it. So let's have a look at your immune system. And we're going to start with the frontline defence and then we're going to go further and further in. And the frontline defence is your skin. Did you know that your skin is a suit of armour? It's a coat of armour. And it protects the inside of the body. But if that armour is broken, if a cut or a scrape or a puncture is made, then we must take steps to clean it and protect it because now the armour has been broken and there are pathogens also. Well, when you've got a lot of plants, did you know one of the roles of plants is to purify the air? The plants take in the waste from the air, take it down to the roots and the, the little microbes in the roots, they eat the waste as food and these leaves are giving off fresh air. Someone said, what's that plant doing right up there? I said, well, it's stopping me tripping over this. <laughs> I'm not used to the big... <laughs> but I love, to, I love to have plants around while I talk. So God created plants for quite a few reasons, but one is to purify the air. And this is a lovely illustration. This has been well looked after, this plant, because it's not covered in dust. <laughs> it's nice and shiny and sometimes inside they get dust on them. But the wider the leaf, the wider the surface area, the more waste it can take in and the more oxygen that it can give off. So when the air is clean and pure, there aren't a lot of pathogens in the air. 
But if we've got stale air, we've got mouldy air, if we've got um, any rotting matter around, the air can be not as pure. And then you will have a lot more <laughs> microorganisms in the air. As we looked at the other day, they're microscopic, you cannot see them. But whenever that, that skin is broken, then you have to protect that skin. I think we all know that. I have some friends who are surgeons and one of them told me that they had a man come in who'd had a motorbike accident. And when he came off the bike, he, 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 he was, um, I don't know what you would say, he went for quite a while along the gravel. So his jeans were broken. And when he came into the emergency, he had this huge graze and it had gravel in it. So what they did was they put him under general anaesthetic, they poured hydrogen peroxide on it and got a scrubbing brush. <laughs> Praise God he was under general anaesthetic. <laughs> that would have hurt very much. Why did they do that? They had to get that gravel and that dirt out. Because if they didn't get the gravel and the dirt out, what happens next? What is an infection? It's actually your body coming in to deal with this, to, to get rid of it. So you, you know, you've got to do your part to, uh, to clean up that area. So whenever the skin gets broken, then the body is now exposed. So the skin is the front line, your defense of your immune system. Let's go to the head. In the head, you've got seven holes. You've got two ears, you've got two nostrils, two eyes and a mouth. So these are all avenues into the inside of the body. Let's begin by looking at the ear. Are there protections there? Oh, they certainly are. There's an eardrum. But also with the eardrum, between the eardrum and the outside, you've got hairs and you've also got some wax. So if anything happens to go in there, you've got the hairs and that'll trap and you've got the wax that'll trap. So there's a protection in those two holes. Let's have a look at these two holes, the eyes. If something were to hit, notice that, that the bones around protect. They protect that going into the eye. And then we've got eyebrows. Now when I was young, I, <coughs> I was not a Christian, and I cut my hair and it was about half an inch all over. And I shaved up my eyebrows. And I remember I was in the rain one day and that's when I realized the eyebrows are there to protect the eye because when it rained, all the rain was going straight down and into my eyes because <laughs> I had no eyebrows. God put the eyebrows there for a purpose. And we We've been living them with them all our life and we don't often think about their purpose. So the eyebrows have a purpose. They prevent things going down into the eye, especially if it's fluid. But you've also got your, your eyelashes and if something goes near the eye, there's a blinking reflex. We blink, which stops things going into the eye. And the eyelashes stop things going into the eye. And if maybe a little bug happens to get through all those processes and into the eye, the eyeball is covered with a, a slippery fluid. So if a bug does get in, it, um, it drowns basically, it suffocates in that fluid. And I think we all know if you get a bug in your eye, if you make your eyes go round and round the world a few times, it'll work its way to the corner and you can flick it out. So the eye has a whole lot of processes of protection, which can be considered part of our immune system. Let's go to the nose now. Inside the nose, there are all these little cavities. And let's say that the air that we're breathing in is not pure air. If it's pure air, it's light and it goes straight down into the trachea and into the lungs. And I'm sure everyone's aware that we have two tubes. We have one tube that goes into our lungs and we have one tube that goes into our stomach. And when we swallow, that closes the tube that goes into the lungs. And so 
When we're breathing in pure air, it goes straight through to the back and down into the lungs. But if we're breathing in air that is not pure, it's a little heavier. Maybe it's got a little dust on it. And because it's heavier, it doesn't fly straight back and into the trachea. It starts to move around and it gets, it's like it's a ricochet, it goes from this side to the other side, all these little caves that are in the nostril and it shoots around backwards and forwards. And the reason for that is to drop off that little molecule of dust. And then, the, and then the air becomes light and can go back down into the trachea and into the lungs. And at the end of the day, especially if a person's been gardening and there's a little bit of dust in the air, they will blow their nose, is that right? <laughs> and you get all those bits of dust have been built up and you can, you can blow it out of your nose. Nose does three things. It purifies the air, it humidifies the air, and it cleans the air. Mouth does not do that. That's why we should be nose breathers, not mouth breathers, because mouth does not purify, humidify, and clean the air. And if someone were to say to me, but I can't breathe through my nose, what's my next question? Why not? Uh, it's all clogged up. Why? Well, if you've got a cold, that's understandable. But some people are constantly clogged up. Why? Well, when there's excess mucus, the body creates that mucus as a protection. So something's irritating the, uh, the respiratory. Something's irritating it, causing the body to make a lot of mucus. So it could be the person's breathing in moldy air. It could be the person's breathing in chemical air. So the mucus is made to protect, or it could be the person's eating the five, or one of the five, or all of the five most common allergens. So let's have a look at these allergens. And we're gonna look at them in a, in a few different ways as we go through looking at the immune system. Refined sugar. And peanuts. <coughs> peanuts are not a nut, peanuts are a legume and they're grown in the ground and they are very susceptible to mould growth. Also the hybridised wheat of today, the hybridisation of the wheat changed the starch structure. We looked at that, um, we looked at that recently. And we're also going to look at it again tonight. Tonight, I think, I think we're looking, oh no, it's two, two parts of heart health tonight. I think it was the night before last we looked at diabetes. Is that right? Yeah, and we looked at what the hybridisation of the wheat did to the starch structure. But the hybridisation of the wheat also changed the gluten or the protein structure. So the gluten or the protein structure is, was traditionally always very fragile. But in the hybridization of the wheat, it created a protein structure that is very complex. So it's very difficult for the average gut to break it down. And that's why we see so much gluten intolerance today. Gluten intolerance is the result of people just overdoing the wheat. It can be a result of uh, um, slightly compromised digestive gut or digestive tract and we're going to look at the digestive tract in more detail on Friday night. So there can be a few reasons why and we also looked at children being fed food too young. When they're fed food too young then they don't have the ability to break it down. We'll be looking at that Friday night when we go through the gut. So that's why the hybridised wheat is there. I'm not talking about the non-hybridised wheat. So what's non-hybridised wheat? Non-hybridised wheat would be um, kamut and enkelhorn or enkhorn and spelt. They are what's often called the ancient grains. They haven't gone through the hybridisation process. So they're not on this list. Oats. I find many people that have allergies to wheat also can have allergies to oats. Not all, 
I would say 70% of people that I meet have an intolerance to the wheat, but about 30% have an intolerance to oats. So some can handle it, some can't. If there's any health problem at all, I say stop it for now, conquer the health problem, and that might be the first thing you try when you start to implement um, other foods again. And the last one is dairy. Cow's milk is excellent milk for baby cows. And all through Europe, people have been eating cheeses and yogurts and dairy for centuries. And because of that, they have the enzymes in the gut to break it down. I'm a fifth generation Australian Scottish descent. It is not in my genes because I, I've never been able to tolerate it very well. People say to me, well, what milk do you drink? I say, I'm weaned. I eat food. Milk is for babies. And we are the only creature that drinks another creature's milk. So we don't need the milk. So they are the five most common allergens and I find probably the most common allergen to dairy is excess mucus, sinus, chest, asthma problems. That's, that's very effective at creating excess mucus. So they also could be the reason why the, peop the person cannot breathe through their, through their nose. Now, if these allergens are stopped in an attempt to conquer something like um, sinus problems, I warn people, it can take at least two months before you see a result. And as we go further into the immune system, um, I, you will see why that is so. So we're going through the holes in the head. We've just looked at the ears and the eyes and the nose. What about the mouth? One man said to me, I tried running up the hill and only breathing through my nose and it was too difficult. I said, that's right. When I'm running up a hill, I'm very glad I can breathe through my nose and my mouth. <laughs> and I'm very glad if I have a cold that I can breathe through my mouth as well as my nose. So it's not that you never breathe through your, mm -hmm. through your mouth, but predominantly we should be breathing through our nose. There is a method of breathing called the Buteyko method. I'm just getting the spelling right, Buteyko. I think it's Taiko. It's the Buteyko method of breathing and the Buteyko method of breathing was first formulated by a Russian professor, Professor Buteyko. He is long past now, but it is a method of breathing that helps control severe, um, severe distress in asthma attacks. And it's a form of breathing where the person breathes short breaths to raise the carbon dioxide levels in their blood. Because when you raise the carbon dioxide levels in your blood, it relaxes smooth muscle. Isn't that interesting? And the smooth muscle is the muscle that causes the constriction of the bronchioles when a person is having an asthma attack. Now usually we should be doing deep breathing but only in the form of when someone is having breathing distress because of an asthma attack, they might go into the Buteyko method of breathing. And I have met many people who've been able to come off their asthma medication by learning the Buteyko method of breathing. Many hospitals have uh, classes, so you have to go for a week and be trained in the Buteyko method of breathing. And what they suggest is that you practice nose breathing by putting a little bit of tape on your mouth. Now you're not putting the tape like that, <laughs> you're putting a little bit of tape just across your mouth. And when you put the tape across your mouth, of course it's forcing you to breathe through your nose. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that if you really need to breathe, you can go because <sighs> the tape is just there. But this, in the Buteyko method of breathing, they stress how important it is to be nose breath breathers. Because when you're a nose breather, 
Your nose is purifying the air, humidifying the air, and cleaning the air. So I wonder if I got them all right there. Humidify, warming and cleaning the air. So purifying the air. They're the three things that nose does. And that's giving excellent air supply to the lungs. Because if it goes down into the lungs and it hasn't been properly cleaned, the good news is there are little hairs in the lungs. And if there's anything of an irritating, uh, irritating nature, then excess mucus is built up in the bronchioles. And you'll notice with people with smoke, they all, what do they have? A smoker's cough. And they have a terrible cough because that cough is the only way to get the waste out of the lungs. That's the only way. I was on a plane trip to, uh, to America. When we used to fly into Dallas, that's a 15 hour plane trip. And my husband was one side and there was another man the other side of me and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and he was just sucking on, you call them candies, we call them lollies, he was sucking on candies nearly the whole time. And I knew straight away this man's a smoker. <laughs> Did you know that they sugar cure tobacco today? And the reason they sugar cure tobacco, so they soak tobacco in sugar water. The reason that they do that is it tastes a little bit better and the cigarette won't go out when they put it on the ashtray. And you notice when people stop smoking, what do they usually do? They eat lots of sugar because they're, they're addicted to sugar because of the sugar that was in the tobacco. So this man was coughing a lot and had to excuse himself in the bathroom a lot because of what he was coughing up and he was, he was on a, a lot of candies or lollies because of that. Now the reason they have that cough is because the, what's going into their lungs is of such an irritating nature, an incredibly irritating nature and so mucus is building up in the lungs and lining the lungs are little hairs. So the hairs basically are like this. So there's the bronchids. And with a smoker, because of the irritating um, nature of what they're taking in, mucus builds up. And with smokers, these hairs are often just all glued down. So when the person is coughing, it's often a loosening of this coming up. The good news is if they stop smoking, Sometimes it's only a matter of weeks, especially if they're coughing up a lot, the more they cough up the better, because where was it before they coughed it out? <laughs> then the hairs certainly can return. If someone, if I, if I ask the guests, um, are your mother and your parents still alive? No. If they tell me their mother or their father or both died from lung cancer, what's my next question? Did they smoke? What's the answer? In 99.9% .9 of cases over the last 40 years, whenever I've asked that question, yes. I think there's just been one or two cases where it wasn't, they weren't smokers, but then I discovered that their parents were smokers or they were, uh, bre they were, they were in a nursery making compost, breathing in a lot of mold, but something, something, of an irritating nature has gone into those lungs. Because as Proverbs 26 verse 2 states, the curse causeless shall not come. And the, in the majority of cases of, of um, people who've been, uh, who have asbestosis, and we, we know it's exposure to asbestos, but you can have a hundred men all exposed to asbestos, but they won't all have asbestosis. The ones that usually, and this is 99.9% .9 of cases, that get asbestosis are smokers. So can you see there's a, th a few threads coming in there and the, the smoking seems to have tipped the scales. So that's looking at the lungs because we're still on the mouth. Now we're going to go to the other tube. And the other tube 
is your esophagus and your esophagus goes down into your stomach. Now if a person happens to eat something that is of an irritating nature or if they happen to eat something, let's say they go into a sandwich shop and the person that is about to make their sandwich just patted the dog. And I, I have been in places where people pat the dog and then eat their dinner. Ah. <laughs> What's on that dog? Dogs are not clean animals. Dogs and cats eat meat and it putrefies as it goes into the gut. So it's common that they're carrying parasites. I used to do a live blood analysis at Misty Mountain Health Retreat and I've looked at hundreds of bloods. And you take one drop and you put it on the, on the slide under the microscope and it comes up on the, on the little television set. And I was looking at a girl's blood one day and I saw some little parasites and you can see them because they move down. They're like little creatures in the blood. They're moving fast. And I'm scrolling around chasing this and I said, do you have any animals in your home? She said, I sleep with three cats every night. I said, well, look what they've given you. Now, I'm not against cats, but I am not in support of the animals in the home. <laughs> when you dig in the garden, your hands are dirty, and of course you wash them before you eat, but when you pat a dog or a pat a cat, your hand doesn't look dirty, does it? <laughs> but you're probably better to eat your meal with a hand covered in dirt than to pat a dog or a cat <laughs> before you, you eat your meal because of what of what they, they can give you. Now if the person is eating something that has just come off the cat, remember, or the dog, remember these are microorganisms, you can't see them with the naked eye. And the uh, magnification on the blood is, is so big you can see them, but if I didn't have it under the microscope I wouldn't see it. You have a front line defence in your stomach and it's called hydrochloric acid. It's one of the front lines of your immune system. Hydro, hydrochloric acid. Now I'm gonna give the short name, so whenever I use it, it's, the short name is this. So hydrochloric acid, if one drop were to go on your skin, it would burn a hole in your skin. And it has a purpose, the hydrochloric acid. In fact, it has a couple of purposes. And on Friday night, we're going to have a look at the digestive. So hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen are released in the stomach. And hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen, they unite to release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. And I think I mentioned the other night, we need an acid environment in the stomach because in an acid environment, this connection doesn't take place if it's not acid. And if it's not an acid enough environment, pepsin can't break down protein. So that's why the, um, the, uh, the, the acid stomach is very, very important. But hydrochloric acid has another role. And this is the other role that's not often talked about. It's antibacterial, it's antifungal. In fact, it's a very broad antimicrobial. So if you eat a sandwich, made by someone who just patted the dog and there may be some little parasites or yeast or bacteria on there and you've got strong hydrochloric acid, it'll wipe it out. In fact, I've got a book called The Physiology of Digestion by Dr. William Beaumont and I'll tell the story in detail on Friday night but he had a patient who'd sustained a gunshot wound to the stomach was an accident in a training school and it healed but ever after the stomach had a little hole in it. It was almost like a mouth with a little flap over it. So he did experiments. He put silk th 
bread with bits of food in it, take it out every couple of hours to determine how long digestion would happen. But what he did one day was he got a syringe and he took out a couple of vials of digestive juice and he put rotten meat in it. And he said it only took about 15 minutes and that rotten meat was dealt with. So the hydrochloric acid not only is an important part of digest digesting your protein, the hydrochloric acid is antifungal, antibacterial, antimicrobial. My daughter has, she lives on seven acres and she has a couple of dogs. So it's, <coughs> it's a country area where she lives. And the neighbour across the road, oh, a calf died or something and the dogs, you know what dogs do when there's a dead animal, they pull it apart and they the dog had pulled the bone over to the front yard and so she was getting her son. She said, get rid of that bone. But the dog is eating rotten, rotten meat and the dog doesn't die. Have you noticed? Have you noticed what dogs eat? They eat terrible things. They've got 10 times the hydrochloric acid that humans have. That's, that's why they don't die. And so this is a frontline defence, is your hydrochloric acid. What would diminish hydrochloric acid? I haven't met anyone with too much hydrochloric acid. And we'll be looking at things like reflux on Friday night. So why would hydrochloric acid be low? And by the way, what would be a sign that hydrochloric acid was low? It's five hours later and the person feels like they've only just eaten. You see, if hydrochloric acid was strong, they'd digest their meal. Well, Dr. Beaumont found it was three and a half to four hours it took to digest a meal. So very strong hydrochloric acid, maybe, it'll, maybe it's all digested within three hours. So if you've got strong or too much hydrochloric acid, and again, I've never met that person, digestion happens really, really fast. One lady I was working with who had irritable bowel, she said, but Barbara, my, my me metabolism is so fast, I've got to eat every few hours. I said, it doesn't matter how fast your metabolism is, digestion, the quickest it will take is three and a half hours. <laughs> so this is not the metabolic rate of the body, this is digestion. So what? What depletes your hydrochloric acid? Drinking with the meals. If you drink especially large amounts with the meal, remember, remember school days? What would happen if you put water in acid? Dilutes it. <laughs> so digestion is a chemical process. And if you add water, you dilute it. If someone's very thirsty after a meal, by all means have a few mouthfuls but please resist drinking huge amounts because that will water down your hydrochloric acid. And what happens is digestion has to stop, the body has to get rid of that water, bring the stomach back, try to, to an acid environment to, to resume digestion. So the things that can dilute hydrochloric acid is large fluid with meals. We should be we should stop drinking half an hour before the meal and resume drinking about an hour and a half to two hours after the meal. Another reason why it's a good idea to, to leave breaks between meals. What, can, what also can, can uh, reduce hydrochloric acid is stress. When we're stressed, that inhibits hydrochloric acid production. That's why when you sit to eat, you should, as one writer said, cast off care and anxious thought when you sit to dine. It should be a happy environment at the meal table. What can also deplete hydrochloric acid is eating every couple of hours. When people are eating every couple of hours, they basically just exhaust their hydrochloric acid. The other thing that can reduce hydrochloric acid is eating the largest meal at the end of the day. When the sun goes down, our body knows it. Now last night we were here with the lights on, 
But our body knew it was dark because of the darkness out there. But right now our body knows it's light because it's lighter now than last night because we've got the sun, the sun coming in. So when the sun goes down, your body knows it and every body function starts to slow down a little bit, ready for bed. So the meal that you could digest very well at breakfast, you are not going to digest very well late at night because everything's on the slowing down. Digestion cannot stop when you're sleeping because if it stops, the food begins to rot and ferment and you can even get tamain poisoning. You've heard of tamain poisoning? That's when the food is just rotting in the stomach. So eating a large meal late at night, that can certainly slow it down. So hydrochloric acid is one of your front lines of defence. Let's go further down the gastrointestinal tract. And by the way, in my book, Self Healed by Design, I've got a chapter called The Stomach's Secret Weapon, Hydrochloric Acid. And so I describe it in detail there. So let's go down, further down the gastrointestinal tract and we come to the small intestine that's lined with villi. And up the middle of the villi is a lacteal, that's part of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is a system that sweeps away waste from the tissues. Your lymphatic system is your body's vacuum cleaner. Over that, or all through this, is little blood capillary networks. And lining, lining the villi is a um, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride in her book Gut and Psychology, she calls it a thick turf wall. And this thick turf wall, we're gonna, we're gonna draw it in green, because turf is green. I'm not saying the lining of your gut is green, <laughs> but just for illustration. And that's made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. So we've got another line of defense there. Now this healthy or friendly bacteria, it's responsible for the final breakdown of the food because as you'll see on Friday night, anything that goes into our gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal tract is not part of us till it gets into the blood. The blood's called Leviticus 1711, the blood is called the life of the flesh because of what it carries to every cell in the body. And so this gut flora is essential for the ability to get the food out of the gut and into the blood. It's responsible for the final breakdown and it's also responsible for the absorption of the food out of the gut and into the blood. But it is the third function that I wanna target right now looking at our immune system, which is protection. So this gut flora protects the blood against any harmful pathogens that might be in the gut. And because meat putrefies, now dogs can get away with it because they've got 10 times the hydrochloric acid that we have, and their gut is about a yard long. Ours is eight yards long. <laughs> and so, by the time it comes out, in fact, by the time it's going through our small intestine, it's starting to putrefy and that's giving off very bad fumes. So we need a system of protection. So the person that patted the dog and then made the sandwich and the person eats the sandwich, if their hydrochloric acid is low because they're drinking with meals, they're eating all day long, they're stressed with their meals, and the bacteria actually gets through or the parasite. Then we've got another line of defence, and that is the gut flora. And so it can wipe it out there. It can protect the blood against any harmful pathogens. But unfortunately today, many people's gut flora is compromised. What would compromise or break down that gut flora? 
If a woman has antibiotics in pregnancy, now antibiotics, one writer said, described it like this, taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. What did the atomic bomb do? It killed the good and the bad. And here's the good. <laughs> and so we've got a little bit of a compromise. So antibiotics will do it. Long-term painkiller use will do it. I was talking to a man a few days ago who had his hand crushed in a roller. They wanted to amputate two tips of finger because they'd gone black and then his wife emailed me. And I said, no, no need for amputation. <laughs> and I showed her what she could do to heal that hand. Now, it was very painful. And I told them about the analgesic effect of cane pepper. So I think it's on uh, Saturday afternoon, we're going to be looking at herbs, and I'll be looking at herbs a little bit there. And he started to take high amounts of cayenne pepper. And he said that he was taking Tylenol at one stage, and he found that the cayenne pepper, it had the same pain-killing effect of Tylenol. Isn't that incredible? And so there is really no need to take painkillers. A lot of people don't realise the alternatives that they have. So long-term painkiller can do it. Also your statin drugs, I think it's tonight we're looking at heart health. The statin drugs also have the ability to break down the gut flora. And refined sugar, what refined sugar does is it feeds the, it feeds the yeast and then you get this imbalance. Every gut has candida in it. There are dozens of different species of candida. And in their right balance, they're not a problem. If you're lactobacillus acidophilus, you're healthy or friendly, bacterias and floras are in right amount, then, then it keeps the candida under control. And the candida is also playing a part in the breakdown uh, of your food. Now, as you'll see on Friday night, the main enzymes responsible for the breakdown of the food are <laughs> in the uh, mouth, in the stomach, and also coming probably mainly from your pancreas. So that's your, they're your main organs of digestion that break the food down. But this gut flora, it's almost like it just does the finishing touches and also causes a release of your B vitamins. So that gut flora is very important. But let's say it's broken down too. And that's why including cultured foods in your diet is so important. You can get some delicious uh, yogurts now, some made out of soy, some made out of, pro well, out of almond. I had some delicious almond, pro almond uh, yogurts lately. Also sauerkraut, the cultured cabbage that the Germans and the Europeans have been eating for centuries. And if you're from Asia, the miso, there's another cultured food. Eating those foods helps to maintain a, a good level of healthy or friendly bacteria in the gut. Now, if it's compromised, what you can do is you can get a vegetarian probiotic powder and take that three quarters of an hour before breakfast because you want it to go way, way, way down. <laughs> down to where your healthy or friendly flora is in your gut. And by the way, what about boosting hydrochloric acid? What can you do to boost hydrochloric acid if your hydrochloric acid is low? Make sure you eat in a friendly environment, don't drink with your meals, have most of your food at breakfast and lunch, and take a, start with a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little water just before the meal or the juice of a lemon just before the meal. There's some simple things that you can do to boost your, your hydrochloric acid. So let's say that, the, that now that pathogen got into the blood because the person's hydrochloric acid level's low because they're eating all day and drinking with their meals. The, the friendly flora is not there and now it's in the blood. So what happens now? Well, now that it's in the blood, we've got another line of defense. And what we're, 
<coughs> what we're going to look at now is probably what most people know as our immune system, which is your white blood cells. So the blood, let's have a look at the blood, because the blood is the healer. And the Bible rightly calls it the life of the flesh. So when blood touches any part of our body, it's bringing life to that area because it contains red blood cells. And the red blood cells carry the oxygen. Oxygen, the most vital element needed for life. The red blood cells also carry nutrients. Every single cell in the body requires nutrients to function. Even your neurotransmitters in your brain are made out of the nutrients you're eating. The red blood cells also carry the water around. In fact, when we're drinking adequate water, our blood is nice and thin. And I know that the best blood thinner is water. How do I know that? Well, I told you I've looked at lots, hundreds of different blood slides and the blood it should be bouncing around like that. And oh dear, it moves very, very fast. It takes one minute for one drop of blood to go around your whole body. So they should be looking like that. But occasionally I'll look at a blood slide and it looks like this. So whenever I see that on a blood slide, I always presume I've spoiled the slide. It's easy to spoil a slide. So one day, five blood slides later, it still looked like this. It was an 18-year-old girl. So I said to her, have you drunk any water today? She said, I don't drink water. Hmm. I said, well, that's interesting. I can't look at your blood. It is so clumped, it is so thick that I, I can't assess it. Her mother came into the room. Her mother was 45. I said, let's look at your mother's blood. And her mother's blood looked like that. I said, well, look at that. Your mother's got healthy blood and you're only 18 and I can't even look at it. Hmm, she said. She did not want to be at our health retreat. Her mother had made her come. But what was interesting, as she sat in the lectures, and the first lecture she was like this, looking out the window very bored, within about half an hour she sat up. She listened. She became interested. In fact, when we came back from the break, she had pen and paper there. <laughs> I looked at her blood a few days later and it looked like that. <laughs> That's easy fixed. And again, I say 98% of the time when I see this and I began to inquire, it's dehydration. That's how I know the best blood thinner is water. And that's easy fixed. <laughs> She's got to drink water. But if the person's blood looked like that and they drank 16 ounces of water, it's quite possible that a few hours later it might look like that because they took so much water in it at once that they've got to quickly find a bathroom because it goes out very quickly. That's why your body can handle it better little by little by little. Half a glass at a time. That's what your body loves and it can it can handle that a lot quicker. By the way, blood has, let's see if I've got a blue, blood has a blue colour. And you can tell arterial blood and you can tell venous blood. Arterial blood is the blood that comes away from the heart and arterial blood is the blood that comes back to the heart because ve sorry, venous blood comes back to the heart. Venous blood has a blue colour because when the blood goes through the lungs and takes up oxygen, it gives a red colour. It is oxygen that causes the blood to be red. Now when that goes through the lungs, how much oxygen is it picking up? Can you see the surface area that's been lost because the blood is clumped? That's why to ensure you're getting adequate oxygen into your body, make sure you're well hydrated. So <laughs> something else that the red blood cell does is carry away waste. 
we're looking at why the blood's called the life of the flesh. So the red blood cells carry the oxygen, they carry the nutrients, they carry the water, and they carry away waste. But red blood cells contains, sorry, the blood contains something else beside the red blood cell, and that is the white blood cell. And the white blood cell are your internal army. So let's have a look at your white blood cells. You have five different types of white blood cells. One is neutrophils. And the neutrophils, they take up about 65% of your white blood cells. They're the main ones that attack and kill enemies in the blood. And then we've got lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the lymphar along there. Lymphocytes are made in your lymphatic system and with your lymphatic system you've got lymph nodes in your neck, under your arms, in your groin and as in your lymphatic system in the nodes particularly that the lymphocytes are made because most of your white blood cells are made in your bone marrow. So the lymphocytes, the lymphocytes are the scouts and they take up 20%. So they're the scouts. What the scouts do is they're roaming around the blood looking for any trouble. And if there's trouble, they message the neutrophils and the neutrophils come along, they, they envelope themselves around the bacteria and they give off hydrogen peroxide which kills it. And basically they die in the process. And that's what pus is, it's dead white blood cells. Monocytes are another white blood cell. And your monocytes take up approximately 10%. And then we've got basophils. Basophils take up 3%. And then eosinophils. Eosinophils take up 2%. So there's your white blood cells. And they all play slightly different roles, but their aim is to wipe out any enemy that's in the blood. Any um, bacteria, yeast, funguses, parasites that are in the blood. If they're working well, that's what they will do.